นพลีสเลตมีโนอิฟยูแคนซีดัสไลท์สนะเย่โอเคเย่เย่ขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบคุณขอบ Which has been inspired by brain. So, before I talk about the solution, I will talk about the challenges that the solution will try to solve. So there are two types of challenges that the solution will try to solve. Uh, the first challenge is about perception. So I'm pretty sure you remember this kind of uh, rear view mirrors, and they used to have these lines. I don't think. Many of them have these lines nowadays because it's a convex mirror, so the objects in the mirror are actually closer than what they appear. So it means that if you see something, you have to act as if it is nearer. Now that implies few things. Number one, okay, how close it is. How do we expect a normal driver to gauge the difference in the actual distance and what it appears here? Secondly. It also takes some cognitive load, like some brain power, to perceive this thing and translate to what might be the actual distance. And while driving long distances, the drivers might not might not be aware of these things. The point is that when we are designing AI algorithms nowadays, especially those which interact with human beings, we are not taking into account a very crucial part, which is How is the user going to react? What he sees as the output from the neural network or the deep learning networks. Uh, that's because the perception level of every human being is different. Number one, number two, even for the same human being, depending on the time and situation that person has been through, uh, his cognitive load is also different. This becomes very crucial. When we are trying to use AI in industrial automation, so in industrial automation, let us say we are implementing an AI algorithm to process the data and uh, find out what's going on in the in the factory, and then display those things to the operator. Now the operator's mental state might not be the same all the time. Sometimes he might be more stressed. How do we make sure that that is taken into account? By the AI algorithm, while it is presenting things to the operator, and if that can be changed so that the operator's reaction is guaranteed. Yeah. The second challenge comes when we talk about our cognitive architectures. So, it's accepted that uh, in at least in neuroscience community. That our uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, the cortical layers, there are like six layers. Through which information is processed. Now, in with each upgoing layer, the abstraction level of information that increases. So, uh, information becomes more and more abstract. There are few challenges which has made it very compli complex to implement the total flow in the human cortex. Number one, there are lots of feedback, as you can see. Uh, there are feedbacks up and down, and there are feedbacks between the action and the uh, and, and the perception cycles, or, or the streams, especially these ones, as you can see, uh, connecting the perception and action branches. Those feedbacks are very difficult to implement in in real softwares. Secondly, how do we implement the top-down information flow? Information as of now, let us say we are using a deep learning algorithm. That takes data and creates information, but the question is: Okay, when we want to take a decision, and can that change the way the deep learning algorithm is processing things? There are a few solutions around, uh, but that's still uh, quite a big challenge. 
And that also takes us to the whole uh, symbolic versus sub-symbolic layers in, in, in brain architecture and how it is, uh, an, it is an ongoing challenge to integrate them together so that we can have a seamless system. Integration has got two challenges. Number one, the top-down thing. And number two, how do we make sure that this top-down information is used properly in training the whole system together? Now, to break that challenge, let us divide the layers into uh, the symbolic and cognitive layers and the non-symbolic layers. Now implementation of non-symbolic layers are quite uh, mature now using deep learning algorithms and also statistical algorithms are also quite powerful in, in this. So the point is that machine learning algorithms are good enough to implement the non-symbolic or sub-symbolic layers. When it comes to the symbolic and cognitive layers, that is where things are a bit more challenging. Some parts, uh, for example, the association cortex, which, which, which can well be modeled by ontological uh, modeling. So that's also to some extent possible to implement. And for implementing the cognitive layers that are established architectures like SOAR and ACTAR. Uh, so these different parts are implemented separately. Now combining them is always a big challenge. Now we are thinking, okay, what can we do so that we can have at least something working. In that, we propose that instead of trying to implement all the layers, let us take the cognitive layers and maybe part of the symbolic layers and replace those with an actual human being. The actual human being will be acting on behalf of these layers. That way, the human being and the uh, uh, non-symbolic or sub-symbolic layers together can act as one cognitive entity. So there are two major challenges in this, uh, this, this architecture. Number one, information feedback from the human being to the primary sensory cortex and primary motor cortex. How does that happen? How do we make sure that this information from the real human being is fed to these layers and just feeding back is not enough, right? Because we should have a methodology, an architecture. We should be able to take those feedback and change them on the fly. So that is the major challenge. And second challenge is that, how do we make sure that this whole system is automated? We don't really want the human being to be sitting and uh, changing 500 knobs. That's not ideal at all. We should have an automated process that sees the reaction level of the human being, quantifies that, and takes that as the information feedback to the non-symbolic layers. So we have got two uh, things that we are trying to combine here. Number one, to implement the cognitive architecture in its totality, we are replacing the upper layers with a real human being. So we are putting the human in loop. Number two, to make sure that the human in loop acts as an integrated part, we are using perception-based quantified labels, which will be used to change the deep learning models. Now, the first one, uh, perception modeling. How do we do that? So let us say we find that, okay, the human being uh, has got certain level of perception. We want that the deep learning which is deep learning models, which are used to model the primary sensory cortex or primary motor cortex, they should change the way they are working. That can be, that can be done in a very elegant manner if we are using some masking layers here. And the level of masking is determined by how much attentive the human being is. For example, if uh, I'm just giving a very crude example, but this, this masking layer part has been already published as another paper. Uh, but this is the way to incorporate that. For example, let us say the human being seems to be a little bit non-attentive. So then the masking can be uh, less, uh, less, more transparent. In that way, it sends more information through the different layers and that way, it can create different outputs slightly so that it can grab the attention of the human being. 
so that way we have already taken care of uh, how do we make sure that the 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 perception level that is measured is taken care of is fed back to the non symbolic layers now with this together we present the total architecture the perception centric human in loop cognitive architecture uh, you, can, you can see that it kind of follows a DIKW data information knowledge wisdom kind of layer architecture. So from the environment, the data is taken and that is processed by machine learning and pattern extraction algorithms. As we all know, uh, CNNs are very powerful pattern extraction uh, uh, architectures. So they can be used as the as the part which takes the data and creates information. Then we are using ontological analysis so that we are creating uh, knowledge or uh, abstract meta information from the information that is generated by the machine learning layers. And those knowledge or those labels, they are presented to the human in loop through user interface, uh, uh, user interface. Now in the action loop, action part of the loop, same thing happens, depending on what the, the user wants to do that is captured by the user interface. And then that is fed to the machine learning based interpretation of commands from the human. And that is then uh, interpreted by another layer of CNN so that uh, it uh, acquiescence and those kind of maneuvers. Now that is, one major challenge here, and that is the perception measurement. So how do we make sure that we measure the perception level or the cognitive load level of the human being? And in that, there are some work and they mostly use a lot of uh, uh, sensors in the body of the human being to measure the level of uh, perception or the measure of uh, the level of cognitive load in the human being. That is fine for lab kind of work, but that's not really enough for uh, uh, some, a real uh, environment. For example, if you want to have uh, the workers in the factory to put them on all the time, that's not going to happen. So we want something that is non-invasive. In that, uh, with keeping that in mind, we, have, uh, we are now focusing on four ways of capturing the perception level of the cognitive load. Number one, a voice-based cognitive load monitoring. So that gets activated only when there is a possible failure, because when there is a possible failure, the human being or the operator on the floor, they usually call the call center or the emergency call center. From the way they are talking, we try to extract the cognitive load. And this is not really a new thing because emotion recognition from speech that's a pretty established field now. Uh, but here we are trying to extract the cognitive load from the, from the speech. Uh, it's, it's, it's incremental, uh, incrementally new, it's not really disruptively new. The second one is eye tracking. And that's also psychological researches and researches in management marketing, they have showed the validity of eye tracking to track the label of uh, cognitive load in the human being. We are using that as well. And if possible, if the operator is working in front of a monitor, then we have the uh, chance to also monitor the dilation of the pupil. Now dilation of pupil is a well proven and accepted way to measure the cognitive uh, engagement of the human being. And lastly, we are using the outputs from health bands, uh, uh, things that, that are already uh, captured anyway by any normal health band, for example, the heart rate variability and the motion of the limbs through the IMU. So using these four, we are still trying to find the quantitative model to find a level of uh, cognitive load that then can be used to modulate uh, the masking level, which can then change the way the machine learning uh, pattern classification layer works. Coming to what's the status now, the current implementation initiatives. 
So I'm working with a group of industries and a university in Sweden through a project in which uh, uh, the focus is mostly if there is a failure on factory flow, how do you make sure that uh, the things are restarted as soon as possible with as little harm to the overall flow as possible. In that, my part, we are focusing on uh, modeling the user cognitive load in the case of failure of machines in factory flow. Uh, so that's just part of the whole the Kaika architecture that I have shown, but that's just a small, uh, small project that has started recently. In addition to that, in terms of the future plans, the big challenge currently in front of us is a proper quantitative model of perception so that you know those four measurements that we discussed, how do we take those and create one or two numbers which will represent the perception level and cognitive load. And that, that's a major scientific blue sky kind of work. And in terms of implementation, we see, we foresee that this kind of architecture will have a lot of use in industrial automation. So we are uh, we, just like uh, the group in Sweden, we are also talking and open to collaborative uh, approaches where we are talking different ind industries to see uh, if we can co-develop uh, this architecture for some industries. And because uh, this can really, really benefit in terms of reducing the failures from human error, because uh, human error is some, you know, it's a broad category that industries use uh, just to say that the human was not attentive, but then human beings are not robots. They're not supposed to be the same level of attentive all the time. How do we make sure that the whole automation system takes the human being also into account? So, yeah, so that's the end of my slides. I'll be very happy to take questions. And as I mentioned, I'm very open to collaborations as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions in the audience? Please raise your hand or ask directly to you. 